I welcome you to um, our program tonight, and I'm glad that some of you were brave enough to come out on this cold night. Um, it's been our thinking uh, on, the founda uh, on the board that when we give awards, we ought to first educate people as to what the criteria are for the judging. And so we thought that tonight this uh, program might be helpful in that way. Um, the, the Lake Forest Historic Preservation is not here to uh, uh, require you to do anything with individual houses, but we like to encourage um, renovation, um, new housing, and so forth to at least consider the neighborhood and the town because Lake Forest is really uh, a very special place as far as uh, historic preservation is concerned. And uh, people from all over uh, come to us for uh, a number of things. So, and we, as far as we know, we were the first to have a, a planned central um, downtown in Market Square. So we are not dictating, but we hope to educate a little bit. So don't worry, we're not coming over to, to, <laughs> to tell you you can't do what you're already doing. Um, today, uh, tonight, Art Miller was going to be here, and uh, it's uh, Franz Schultz's 80th birthday, so he um, thought it was going to be a luncheon, and it turned out to be a black tie dinner tonight. So I'm, I'm going to be referring to some of the notes that he would have been using. And then we're going to show some slides of houses in the community, and then we'll have a period of uh, questions afterwards. Also, I, I want to change one thing in the handout that you got. It says that um, the awards will be made in May. They will be made on April 29th, and the judging will be in the first week of April. So if all of the applications are in, we hope by March 25th, then we will go ahead with the, the judging after that. If you have any further questions on that, we'll talk about that later. Now, the important thing uh, is that our local historic character is not a style such as Charleston, South Carolina, or Williamsburg, um, Washington, D.C., uh, but a classic approach to planning and coordinating the elements of projects. That includes gardening as well as uh, gardens as well as buildings. These elements include style, site selection, relationship among the parts of the plan and among materials, and integration of architecture with the landscape setting. I think, uh, at least I know, my family and I moved to Lake Forest because of this. I had lived uh, along the shore and for a number of years, and I found it so attractive um, the, uh, that uh, this is where I wanted to come. Now, um, when I say classic, really, in some ways, it goes back to Greece and Rome, but not really classical in that sense, necessarily, because what you see in Lake Forest is a variety of, of um, designs, but there are certain things that make them more classic, and the classic period in Lake Forest was between 1893 uh, and... Um, 1942, really, up until the Second World War. Now, one reason I think, <clears throat> uh, I know Chicago architecture pretty well, and I did my paper when I became a docent for the Architecture Foundation on Daniel Burnham, and one reason that classical architecture has been so important in the Chicago area is because of Daniel Burnham and um, and some of the other architects, many of the architects, went to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And, of course, the 1893 Columbian Exposition was uh, designed based on uh, the designs of, uh, that they had learned at the Beaux-Arts. And Field Museum, Museum of Science and Industry, and so forth are, are uh, remnants of that. So, and because so many um, of the businessmen in Chicago came up here, 
for their homes that I think it was a natural progression, um, much more so than you see in some of the other suburbs around Chicago. So um, this half century from 93 to 42 defined the historic architectural character of Lake Forest, according to Art Miller. As the, as, and he says, as the spectacular landscape development from the 1850s and 1860s was respected, while houses from the early period were replaced by new ones planned on Beaux-Arts principles, which included deference to the natural and design landscape character. And so along the bluff we see uh, places like this. I'm just going to illustrate by one the David Adler uh, house that he built for the, uh, the Reeds, which is uh, on Lake Road. And um, during these 50 years, there were about 50 classic architects, many different architects, who contributed designs to Lake Forest's historic character, either studied in Paris or they studied architecture at a school modeled on the Ecole, and that was MIT. And um, uh, name right, what, the one who designed <laughs> Shaw. Shaw. <laughs> um, he went to the Ecole, he went to MIT, and he also was a graduate of Yale. And Yale, of course, has a very fine architecture school. So he came with uh, many credentials, uh, much background in that area. Now, after uh, World War II and, and um, the Depression, uh, with a steeply graduated income tax, some of the, the large homes were torn down. And um, the ones that were uh, built during that time were often uh, one-story houses, ranch-style uh, houses. And, but in many, many cases, the land was still um, coordinated with the larger house or the gardens were uh, kept and um, so that they blended in with the new housing. So um, the, the, the character of a neighborhood was always important so that if you did something to your house, it wasn't going to um, just destroy what uh, others in the neighborhood had done. And one thing I found about um, uh, Howard Shaw was that he never wrote any books, but he, he did have a handwritten speech that he gave, and he declared that you must never have a building that is overpowering, powering, attention-calling structure next to someone. It's almost the same as murdering him or her. <laughs> And I think as I, uh, I, I'm not thinking of any particular houses, but I've seen some along the shore where I do feel that they're trying to murder their neighbors. <laughs> now, um, there's some key principles uh, of classic architecture taught by the Ecole, and uh, Art has some of these down, and I will mention them, um, probably not in full detail, but at least mention them. One is you have a plan. And we can see this in, in Lake Forest because we have a number of uh, districts that have been planned. Now, the one that we uh, were excited about, and still are, in August was the West Park uh, area. And that was, um, if you drive by there, you see that it has the curving roads. Um, this, of course, was developed in 1907, beginning in 1907, for, I guess, um, uh, some of the men at the On Wednesday Club wanted places for their younger children and also the professionals, such as doctors and also the businessmen in town, to have a place to live. And um, so they sold the lots, as I remember, for $5,000. Am I right, Jim? Mm -hmm. and, um, and they sold them quite readily. And they had to pay up in five years. And so in 1912, these men, Howard Shaw and, and other architects and city fathers, had the money to start developing Market Square, which uh, began, well, the planning certainly 
began in uh, 1912, although it was thought of before. And one thing that I like about um, Lake Forest is that there are people who are so civic-minded that they're not just thinking of themselves and what they want for their own house. They, they think of what would be good for the community in so many cases. And these early men certainly uh, did that. So you start with a plan. We had some other uh, planned areas. Um, um, Stanley Anderson did the Deer Path uh, Hill Estates. Um, the Lasker Estate, where I live, uh, is certainly not a, a fancy, uh, I mean, the houses around, but we have curving rows, and, and all, all the houses really fit in with that um, very classic uh, building that Adler built for um, uh, Lasky, uh, Lasker when he, uh, he came to town way back in, in the teens. So, um, and there are many others, too, that we may talk about. Now, you have a courtyard oftentimes, and even when you go out to um, uh, the... Um, out to Ragdale, the barn house, you will see that that was built around a courtyard. And they've restored that in quite a nice way, I think. And then also, um, if you know the Cuneo Museum out in Liberty or Vernon Hills, that is around a courtyard. Then you also have a central hall that comes in from this uh, main door and uh, with um, rooms on either side and usually you, they went from the, um, the the lesser rooms as you went out from the main rooms where they use better materials and so forth and then oftentimes that main um, aisle went back or hallway went back to a, a gallery that went um, across it and examples of that are Ragdale and also again the Reed House so um, that was important. Then um, some of the elements. The plan, this plan organized together in one scheme a project of more than one element or building, such as Shaw's Market Square, Elowa Farm, um, the city-owned stable complex that David Adler designed, the two gatehouses and the garage. The proportion was important. Elements of a building relate to each other according to established ratios. However, I might say at Market Square, all the buildings there outside the square that are um, that extend out were not built by at that time. With I mean, they were built at the time, but not with that plan necessarily. But if you look carefully, they really go together with the other buildings. And even in Market Square, you have two towers, but the towers are not the same. So um, it's not building something the same, uh, duplicating it necessarily, but it's thinking of these other things. Um, he also, uh, Art Miller also suggested that this principle of hierarchy of form the greatest height and the best or strongest materials in a project are um, given to the most important element with the secondary wings. Now, he uses it as an example, Lake Forest Co uh, College. The architects were Frost and Granger, and he's uh, looked particularly at the chapel in Reed Hall that were built in 1899, 1900. Uh, the key campus buildings are s surmounted by a chapel tower and they are cloaked in gray. Bedford limestone, a strong material. The Blackstone Harlan Residence Hall complex, just to the south, in red brick with limestone trim, at the same time two-story height and with towers forming an entry gate to the campus, also a major feature. But the step down in materials clearly signals the lower role of these buildings within the campus cluster secondary to the academic and chapel buildings. Now another thing is repetition. The regular reiteration of features across a facade, such as windows or columns, or on a streetscape, adds to the dignity and calming order of presentation. Now one example is um, 
the Anderson block, Stanley Anderson block, that was built in 1903 that Walgreens uh, uh, inhabits at the, um, at the corner of Western and uh, Deer Path, is a Georgian classic three-story story building designed, um, well, it's called the Anderson block, excuse me. It was designed by architect James Gamble Rogers. Its regularly spaced windows with a limestone trimmed red brick facade preserve a dignity at this important corner, which is undisturbed by the commercial chain tenant traffic below. The next uh, element is harmony. This key Beaux-Arts precept is at the core of classical respect and civility for surrounding contexts built and natural. The, um, and we could go back to um, Howard Shaw's comment that you don't build something that uh, tries to kill something next door. You always uh, are thinking of how, and also not look into the windows of the property next door if it can be helped at all. That was one thing that Art mentioned to me the other day. So. Um, Another uh, area that he, uh, he talked about was symmetry and balance, but he also was giving me the example of the faculty housing over at Lake Forest College. Now these uh, were built early, early, and they built uh, these houses with five bedrooms, and I said to him, uh, why did they need five bedrooms? Well, in those days you had more help. Um, you had to because you, you didn't have all the conveniences that we have now. And, Art was saying we really live as the wealthy live today in, in, as a member of the middle class. But when they built more, as they had more faculty in the 30s, they couldn't spend that much money. So it took quite a, 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 quite a bit of talking to the city to get them to allow them to build um, townhouses or two houses with a, a, a same wall. And I went over there yesterday, uh, the other day to look at them, and, and they blend in with the larger houses, whereas the, their talking point back in the 30s was if you have these small little uh, houses, it, they're not going to look right with the larger five-bedroom faculty houses. Now another um, element is transparency. The coordination of interior and exterior spaces includes managing the circulation to include exterior terraces and gardens, garden spaces to be integral parts of the plan. I think all of the houses we've had on our house walks, I was thinking back, uh, have done that so that uh, it's a free flow between uh, the interior of the house and the gardens. Now. Uh, some uh, one example of this is our library. The architect Edwin Clark's 1931 Lake Forest Library is very formal, and it has a symmetrical facade, one side of the entry the same as the other. And and then of course we we see this uh, to a large extent in in Market Square. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright had. Uh, built many buildings up here, or Mies van der Rohe, um, I think perhaps we would have had a, a, some quite different variations of our architecture. So uh, the, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts uh, derived des design principles could be employed with a, lot, with a wide range of materials um, and national architectural and landscaped styles portrayed with unprecedented accuracy and widely distributed in this period. And uh, people even went to um, old gardeners such as Rose Standish Nichols' uh, garden book and, and others. And, and uh, of course, um, they came and designed their gardens. And on the west side, uh, when that started to be developed, Again, they, they planned it with, with gardens and open spaces and vistas so that um, you're not just crowded in uh, one house next to the other. Some examples are the Peary Place at 930 East Rosemary. 
That was built in 1905 by Benjamin Marshall, who did the Cuneo um, house as well in Vernon Hills. It centers on the simple classic Georgian house with a balanced facade with an English landscape lawn, a formal French court north of the living room, past flower beds and a white garden beyond, recalling from the Peary landscape designer Rose Nichols' own 1902 book, A French-Inspired Garden Space, with a quiet pool and tall trees, such as she had designed at Melbourne in England. So I guess what, uh, what I'd like to say is that um, Lake Forest has planned, has tried to plan, and we would like people, we're not going to make you do this, of course, but at least think in terms of some of the principles that have been at the basis, particularly in those 50 years, because Art Miller feels that those 50 years between 1893 and 1942 really marked the architectural style of Lake Forest. Now, um, Pauline Moore is going to show some slides of some of these houses and some of the things that um, are really important. Uh, I wrote some of those out in that, um, that, pamp that handout that you have, shutters, dormers, roof lines, and things like that. And so think of questions, and at the end, why we will be glad, if we can, to answer. All right, Pauline? Jane has created the setting for you of uh, Lake Forest and the Lake Forest style and um, the visual character of Lake Forest. Um, in 1991, the Preservation Foundation decided that we would like to reward those individuals um, who had property in Lake Forest or were going to build in Lake Forest um, for uh, staying within that character, uh, for preserving historic homes, for rehabilitating them, adding to them to make them livable for today if that were necessary. So we um, formed the um, idea of having a preservation award competition in a sense and that was the first year. This program was to explain how we do the judging on that, and that's really what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to be very specific about things. And I am going to show some slides. They aren't all in Lake Forest, but uh, the sl slides are all meant to um, uh, illustrate uh, the things that we look at, the standards that we use in, in judging. First of all, we have to set up a judging panel, and I think you should know about that. Uh, the president of the, the foundation board chooses a chairman. That chairman chooses two other board members to serve on the panel and two at-large members. Uh, the at-large members um, include, since we uh, had a, a historic preservation commission, a member from that commission. And then we have always had uh, what we call an outside expert, someone either from the National Trust, Landmarks Preservation Council, uh, preservation architect, and we've had people from other historic preservation commissions in uh, communities outside of Lake Forest. So that's the judging panel. Um, in the handouts, you had a nomination sheet. That nomination sheet comes in, and it comes in with a uh, picture of the home uh, that has been nominated. We're going to look at the whole, the picture of a whole home. Uh, this obviously is not in Lake Forest. It's Rustop Manor, and it is a 16th century home in England. But I want you to look at the whole because later on we're going to look at parts, and some of the parts that we are going to look at you can see in Rustoff Manor, 16th century England. The next house is also a country house in England called Crone. And the same thing is true. We're looking at the whole, a lovely manor house that has um, you know, existed for four centuries. But the parts are parts that still exist and uh, that are used in homes in Lake Forest. The last one from England is a Northcombe house that's 18th century. You can see 
uh, uh, a little bit of the entrance, the fenestration, and the dormers on that. The next house is 18th century. Now we're back in America, in um, Virginia, and a very famous home, and you're going to be seeing more of this home. This is Westover on the James River, and this is the um, river, uh, uh, riverside of the home. This is Carter's Grove, also in Virginia near Williamsburg. Um, and again, I just want you to look at the hole and see how lovely it is, and then let your eye come in on some of the details. But let's come into the 20th century and on Lake Forest, uh, the Fernald House on Awani, uh, Shaw, 1908. This is Delano and Aldrich on Deer Path, and uh, it's 1925, and that's Farallon. So um, study that a little bit because we're going to come back to some details on this house. Now we come to Shaw's Clayton Mark House on Lake Road. And finally, Derwin Marr on Deer Path, a Tudor house. Now these are all either grand manor houses or great estates. But a home need not be in that category. In fact, we encourage uh, homes that are more modest, and they qualify as well for awards, and many of them have received awards. We're looking at Dorwin Marr, um, a Tudor house, but a few streets over, we have another Tudor, more modest. And here are others, bungalows and four squares, all in Lake Forest, all really nicely uh, rehabilitated, and all would qualify for awards. Uh, we also look at institutional and commercial buildings, and of course that's the Northern Trust Bank, Stanley Anderson, um, uh, Dickinson Hall, which um, is now the Senior Center, and uh, that did receive uh, a rehabilitation award from uh, the community. Now, I've asked you to look at the whole, and now we're going to look at some parts. And the first part that we're going to look at is something very small, something very easy to get right, and something that is so often wrong, and those are nothing other than shutters. If you know the history of <laughs> shutters, <laughs> if you were interested in that, you would realize that back in time, glass was hard to come by, and a lot of the window openings didn't have glass, so shutters uh, were very functional. Uh, they uh, were used for security, they were used to keep out the weather, so they closed, which meant that they had to be hinged, which meant that they had to cover the entire window. How often uh, we see that this is not the case, even in, on very lovely houses and really good projects. I mean, you would be surprised. I won't name them, but there have been a few that uh, you, do, you wouldn't believe that everything else was done uh, you know, tremendously uh, down to the last detail, and then the shutters are wrong. But anyway, here are some shutters on a French house. Um, right size, on hinges, they will close. Here are some shutters in Lake Forest. It's the same thing. They are half the width of the window. They would close. They would even close over the um, iron grating. They're hinged, and they're shutter dogs to hold, hold them in place. I don't know if I should confess this. They are hung backwards, which most shutters are today because um, the louvers would go toward the house when they were open, and then they would go um, away from the house when they were closed to keep the rain out. And I think for practical purposes, which we do allow some practicality in your restoration and rehabilitation projects, um, to keep water away from the house, there often you will find that they're hung backwards. This is new construction in Lake Forest, and, and the shutters are, are hinged and are the correct size, and um, they have shutter dogs. The next thing, uh, and, and it's a big thing, are windows. All right, here is a window with two divided uh, lights. The, uh, the articulation has dimension to it. Um, and here is uh, Palladian, 
And again, it's everything is articulated, it's true divided light. We don't insist on true divided lights for windows. Uh, you can have applied muttons, but we, it has to have dimension. It cannot be those muttons that are between two pieces of glass or, you know, they, they, they almost look like you had taken tape and taped on the uh, panes. Okay, here is um, a very nice Palladian window that, of course, is on um, Mount Vernon. And we're going to have another slide of Mount Vernon for another detail a little later. And these are beautiful windows on um, Monticello. And they're very interesting. If you look at the, the window at the right, they open from the bottom up. And so you can walk in there and use it as a door. And actually, there are some houses in Lake Forest. I, I think it's the A.B. Dick house has windows in, in the living room that open that way. So you can uh, open the windows and walk out to the garden. Here is a Palladian window done, not the way we want to see it. Um, it's, it's very flat, and the, the um, muttons are not uh, true divided lights. They're not true divided lights. And, uh, well, you, your eye tells you what that is. <laughs> and then this is the ultimate. I, I th guess that's a cartoon of a Palladian window. And fortunately, it's not, I don't think that's in Lake Forest. I hope not. All columns. That's another thing we look at are the columns. And of course, that goes back to Greece. And they were actually used for support. They're holding up that. <laughs> The pediment. This is Mount Vernon. Now, on the columns, the one thing that we noticed, of course, there's proportion, and there there are formulas for the proportion. And um, I I would say we're not like we don't go out and measure and uh, sure that the proportions are right. But one thing that we absolutely look at is because even though these columns are not really supporting anymore, they're used for decorative, a decorative element, they should look like they are supporting. And so therefore, the, uh, the column, the capital, and uh, the, the, yes, the capital and the abacus should be set out a little bit from uh, the architrave. And uh, this, you can't see it as well here, but you will see it on the next one. Do you see how they come out a little bit from the, the architrave there? Uh, the next one is Adler's own home, and uh, they're pilasters, but again, he has kept that articulation of uh, the uh, abacus coming out a little bit. This is what we see very often. The column set back. I think you can see that on the slide. And on this one, very definitely, they're set way under. And once you're used to, you know, the way columns really should look, that really does bother you. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but we know on your house that everything is right. And sometimes, occasionally, a really great architect can break from tradition and it looks okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right. And then the, the next um, element that we're going to look at are dormers. I, you know, dormers were really designed um, to let in light in an attic. And uh, this is going back to Crone. I showed this, you know, under the hole. And they're tiny little dormers up there, and obviously they were, uh, uh, they were used to let light into the attic area of that home. Um, when I looked at this picture cl very closely, I realized that uh, the windows were open, so they were using them for ventilation when this was taken. And uh, I, I just uh, I did put Mount Vernon in again. You can see a little bit of the dormers, but the reason I did it is we have a house, Summerfield, on uh, Waukegan Road. Uh, an architect lives there, and he added these dormers. But uh, he added them, you know, in correct proportions. They um, have made that house look more like Mount Vernon than it did before. This is uh, Adler, and that's the Armour Estate on Green Bay Road. And Adler has done perfectly proportioned dorm dormers on that. 
uh, home. Uh, there we have dormers with uh, hip roofs, and, and again, they're proportioned correctly. One uh, rule about dormers is that the window jam and the corner board really should meet. There should not be siding material between uh, the two. And that's the way this has been done, and that's the way the other dormers that you had seen in the um, slides were done. And here are um, dormers with uh, gable roofs. And again, the window jam and the corner boards are um, adjacent. There's no siding material, in the port and they're correctly proportioned. There are also, um, well, now here's some new construction. And you can see the proportions are very different on that from the, the other ones that we saw. But they have a gable roof. They have uh, done a return on the gables, and they are, those aren't too exaggerated. But I know if you go around town and start looking, you will see exaggerated gable returns on dormers, but also on gable roofs. And uh, one person described them as pork chops, pork chops on the end of a gable. And then these are hip roof uh, dormers on a garage. but. Um, you decide on the proportions of those compared to the ones that I showed you on uh, the other homes. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about are entries. The, these are French gables on uh, the Adler Gatehouse, and they have the uh, half round top, and uh, the proportion on, on those gables should be two to one, and they, they are pretty much that way. They are that way, and um, that's an example of a very nice gable. This is a sketch on entryways and um, came out of a pattern book. And um, back in the colonial days, they used pattern books a lot. And during the, the era that um, Jane talked about um, on, on 1893 to 1941, uh, pattern books were used extensively then, too. Uh, this is, we're back at Westover. This is uh, the, the entrance on the riverside, and it's called the most copied door in the United States. And I went around Lake Forest at one point and took about, I don't know, 10, no, Roger Moore took about uh, at least 10 or 15 pictures of copies of this door in varying degrees of excellence, I will say. This is the land side of uh, Westover entry. And uh, these have a lot of descendants. For example, the armor house. See the arched pediment over that, very much like the uh, land uh, entry for Westover, land side entry for Westover. This is a house on West Park. And it's very nice um, entry, and it also echoes the Riverside entrance to um, Westover. This is has taken it down to you know really uh, taken it down, and the pilasters now have become very simple. Um, the pediment isn't there really, but I think it's a nice entryway. This house, can you take a guess the year it was built? Um, I said we were looking at parts. First we looked at the whole, we looked at parts, and now we're looking at the whole again. Uh, this house, all the parts, they've got it right, and it was built in 2002, so it's still being done. Uh, it's not in Lake Forest, it's out east. It's Ann Fairchild. She's the new president of the Institute for Classical Architecture, but it's uh, Ferris Child and Salmons, and they've done some really beautiful homes. And I have an interior, interior shots of this, and they're just gorgeous. But I guess what I didn't say at the beginning, uh, Jane uh, mentioned uh, you know, the, the layout of the interiors and so forth. In the uh, uh, Preservation Awards, we only do exteriors. We aren't going to 
go inside your house and tell you what you should do there. Maybe another year we'll decide to do that, but we don't do that now. Uh, and about maybe five to eight years ago, uh, we were finding that there were, uh, we were starting to get a lot of new construction in established neighborhoods. And so our awards now are uh, really uh, coordinate with the Department of Interior's standards for uh, treatment of historic, uh, historic properties. But uh, this, this um, next award uh, is not from the Department of Interior because we created it. We called it the Infill Award. That is new construction in an established neighborhood. I have the next few slides actually came from Art Miller. He went around and um, what they illustrate are uh, a number of houses grouped together, but the roofs all work, work together. And uh, so it's a cohesive uh, neighborhood feeling. Uh, these are in Deer Path Hills Estates, the last two. And this is also, that, that's the, the, uh, the French house on the corner, I believe, of, is it King Muir, I think. And so he's showing that there are different styles of houses, um, but they aren't jarring against one another. They all coordinate. And then the last one is on uh, Wildwood, where there's been a lot of redevelopment on that street. Now, and what he is saying is these are roof lines working together. And um, just to bring a little levity, and I have a few slides of roof lines that don't even work with themselves. That's one house. That's another one house. That. So I, what I'll finish with is I'll show um, last year's winners, and then Jane and I will take any questions that you might have. You know this one, the Quinlan House, that was uh, a rehabilitation from top to bottom. And what I loved about this is these are the, the this house has the original windows. And, you know, they, they put in new cords, and, but the wood is there, everything is there. This is uh, two gables. We're all familiar with two gables and the, the uh, rehabilitation that went on there with the uh, addition and uh, rehabilitating the original part of the house. And, uh, I think the whole community is grateful uh, to the people who did that, uh, De Philippus and, and Bruce Grieve. This was mentioned in Jane's speech, the barn house. That um, a flat roofed garage was um, taken down and they redid it in its original configuration pretty much. This is a log cabin. It was a playhouse for the Al Alfred Mansfield estate. And um, the estate was subdivided. The uh, manor house is on a lot. And then there was uh, an empty lot created. And the people who built a home on that um, took the um, log house as well, that lot as well, and um, rehabilitated it. And it's just the same way it was when it was built. Uh, this may surprise you. It's a keck and keck. Uh, but 1956, so it made the 50-year mark, and um, I think it looks good in the photograph, but the Keck and Keck houses are really uh, amazing and fantastic houses, and they really have a beauty. Um, it, it's not a favorite style in Lake Forest, but uh, we are very grateful to the owner who, this was a preservation award, nothing has changed on this house. It was just the way the, the architects uh, designed it. And last was um, a rehabilitation, adaptive reuse, and you know this was the Canals building. And I think that was really a wonderful project. I love going there, and um, it's just brought so much life to that corner. So now we'll take your questions. There's a lot of emphasis in this presentation on manor homes. 
But I know that historically, uh, a lot of more <coughs> modest homes have won awards. And uh, I'd like you to say a little bit more about that, lest people think that they have to have a great uh, estate in order to get uh, considered for an award, because I know that that's not the case. <laughs> I know that man very well. Um, <laughs> I thought I covered that by showing uh, the bungalows and the little tutor, but I can see he is almost always right that it probably should have had more emphasis. There have been a number of uh, small homes which have won awards. I would say probably, um, I'd have to count, but almost an equal number of them. And we have worked hard on getting people to uh, submit nominations for uh, the vernacular homes, smaller homes, uh, as well as the manor houses. Well, I say that because in your book, the book that Preservation Foundation puts out on historic homes in Lake Forest, uh, those are not all award winners, although they could be. They aren't what? Award winners. No. Well, well, okay, I'm going to stop you there. He's talking. I, I don't know if the microphone could pick up the question. Um, uh, his question, and I know what he was going to say, well, we, the, the Preservation Foundation guidebook to National Register properties uh, doesn't have a lot of small homes in it. And that's because that book was on the National Register properties within the East Lake Forest National Register District, they had to be contributing structures, and those contributing structures were all the large homes. In the back of the guidebook, a separate National Register District is the Vine Oakwood District, and those homes are pictured in the back. So it, it wasn't the foundation um, thinking that the smaller homes weren't valuable. It was um, the principle upon which that guidebook uh, was uh, developed, which again was, uh, you know, contributing structures in a National Register district. And I, there are, are people that could have complaints because we couldn't put every uh, one of the contributing structures in there. There had to be, you know, a, a committee made uh, the decision on which ones would be included in that guidebook, and the thought would be, you know, probably we should do another guidebook. So maybe we won't. I have a question. Yes. How many years have the Preservation Awards been awarded? 1991 was the first year. So I guess this this the 17th, will be the 17th. Um, and how many homes have received awards, approximately? Well. Five to ten a year? Well, it, uh, we used to just do a few a year, and then it, uh, we got to a point where maybe for about four years there would be like 10 or 12 awards, and then we decided that, you know, we needed to kind of sit back and look at our criteria again and really apply the criteria. and. Um, Last Well, you saw how many awards were made last year. And also, which we, we didn't cover tonight, we do give awards for gardens, restored gardens, um, uh, for other, um, you know, gates, the, uh, the gates on Deer Path that used to be the entry to uh, Westmoreland received an award. Um, so it doesn't, actually it doesn't have to be a house. You can nominate uh, an uh, outbuilding on your property or as I said, a gate, your garden if it's been restored, uh, anything um, historic, except your grandmother. <laughs> I've had occasion uh, in the last few weeks to talk before other groups, and I've always said that uh, while I represent the Preservation Foundation as its president, president, that I always feel inadequate because of the work of people who have been on the Preservation Board in the past and those who are working on it today. And we have two examples in Jane and Pauline tonight who have done a superb job in putting this program together. One of the outstanding facets of this is 
while it's cold out tonight and the audience is not as large as we would have liked, the uh, program has been taped and hundreds of people will see it on the channel, the Lake Forest channel in the next month. And the opportunity for people to, to have looked and heard the details of this program uh, will be vastly rewarding to the results that are going to be achieved this spring. Uh, before I say good night to you, um, we are going to have a what promises to be an outstanding program, which I believe uh, virtually every one of you will want to attend on Sunday, March 25th at 2.30 in the Stewart Room downstairs. We are going to have a program on preserving Market Square, its history, significance, and future. Uh, Arthur Milley and Shirley Paddock and uh, a representative of this community will uh, speak on th that. It is virtually the last Sunday in, in, in March. Uh, it will be on our website, lfpf.org. Anyone can uh, tune into that. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>